You have one unheard message. First unheard message sent yesterday at 7.15 p.m. Hey, Kelly, it's Rich from the auto auction. What role does authenticity play in building strong relationships within a team? When you have a second, can you meet me at the gate? I'm Rich Levine, and this is Meet Me at the Gate, where we're not just talking theory, we're tackling real-world problems head-on, driving solutions that supercharge productivity and team dynamics. Every episode is a journey towards improvement, empowering you, the manager, to lead with innovation and confidence. Join us to transform everyday roadblocks into highways for success. I want your side. I want your opinion. So help me as an operations manager understand if you're from the HR world, that HR lens, what qualities go into making a good leader? I think there's a lot. The first thing that comes to mind for me is the ability to build relationships. And one of those ways is being genuine. I like to think of it as, you know, and even personally, right? I connect with really good leaders that are real. So being able to be authentic and connecting with their teams. In order to lead people, you have to have people want to follow you, connect with you, trust you. So I would say that's probably another one as well as being trustworthy as a leader. Um, but I'll continue to go back to the genuine auth- and authenticity, authentic. So let's yeah. see if we can tackle this. Cause those, I love what you said. And I picked up on three things, uh, real or authenticity. Yeah. Um, I heard you say trust. And then I heard you also say relationship building. When you're coaching or working with a manager, how do you determine if somebody has these abilities or let's start with your one of them I love is authenticity or real. What does that even mean? It's a good point because it's different for each person, right? I think it's getting to the root of who is the leader as a person and then how they can help connect with their team members. There's a component that goes into it also of self-awareness, which is hard at times for people to have, right? Either you have it or it's something that you have to work on and it's a continuous work, even if you do have self-awareness. So I think coaching leaders to be able to look at how are they perceived in the organization, you can do that in many different ways. You can talk to individuals, you can observe them working with their business partner in the roles that I'm in. That's what the business partner can do is observe leaders in meetings with the rest of their company and see how the teams are connecting. You could do surveys as well to get at kind of that perception and how well they're doing and leading their teams. But it's definitely most oftentimes a growth opportunity to have that conversation around perception and if they are being authentic with their teams and showing up in the right way. So if we were a submarine, we're going deep really fast. (laughs) And I want to go to the next next piece of the submarine diving down is what you just said as far as Uh, is self-awareness. But before we get to self-awareness, you touched on another piece. Well, you talked about reality or being real or being authentic. One of the pieces I do is I study behavior science. And there's a theory that came out of my undergrad from sociology called front stage, backstage. Basically, what what it says is that there's a front stage and a backstage. And if we look at work as the front stage, and let's take home as an example, as the backstage. Front stage is what do you show, how are you showing up at work? And a lot of times what happens or what becomes reality for people, and they do this without in, without even thinking about it, is they build in their mind a visual of how they believe they should show up at work. So let's say you're a manager and you build this vision in your mind that you need to show up as work as getting things done, making sure all the checks make it to the bank, make sure all the floors, you know, if we're talking auctions, it offers get closed out, all the cars get checked in, all the CRs. So you, you build this belief that that's who you are. Now, the backstage is at home. So how do you behave when you're at home? We probably stop. You probably don't think about it when you walk through the front door. You just go in and you like you drop your bags down, your purse down, your backpack, whatever you have from work, kick your shoes off, put your feet up, sit back and wait to make you either make dinner, have somebody make dinner, DoorDash delivers, whatever. But you don't think about what it is and you kind of turn into a different person. So now we got to determine which one's real and which one's not. Unfortunately, the real person is usually how you show up at home. How do you treat your family? How do you treat your dog? How do you treat your cat? At work, we start treating other things, other people differently because we believe that's what somebody else thinks we want to do. Right. So how do we blend? Role, role needs, right? Or we think that that's what we need to be in, in the role that we're in. Correct. How do you break that? How do you help a manager 
who's showing up at work and you're trying to determine, all right, maybe, let's just say they're, they're maybe a little bit on, on the command and control side. Hey, we got to get all the cars checked in. We got to get all the money deposited. We got to get whatever it is done. How do you help them? I think definitely in having a conversation with them. I think we can help with, uh, I know we've talked about personality tests before, right? Getting them to view that the way that they're viewing and the way that they're leading individuals might not be hitting them in the same spot. I think it's having that conversation, maybe almost like what we just talked about is maybe giving them an example of how do you show up at home? I think bridging those two gaps of being as real as you can be at work, still being professional, obviously, right? But getting to that place where there isn't that big of a gap between how you show up at work and how you're showing up at home. So that's where you're going to get to that realness of who you actually are, who you can feel comfortable with and how people are going to trust you even more is by knowing that it's real and you're not putting on these two different kind of fronts, depending on the work, where you are. Now let's go to the next step. Uh, give me your input on self-awareness. How do we build self-awareness? You're a manager. You need to understand how your actions, how do your actions affect others at work? How do you help somebody? What do you do? I think it might depend on their personality as well. If it's someone with that's a data-driven individual, you might have to give them data. You might have to do a survey for the team that, that they support give them data on certain points of being like, this is how you are, you know, showing up to your team right now. This is how your scores are. It's having that conversation with them again of real honest conversations about either what they're doing really well, right? Hey, you're really connecting with people here. I can see that your team is doing awesome in whatever metric, whatever number, probably because you're showing up this way. If it's not, maybe looking at asking them, like, what do you think the root cause of this is? Do you feel like you showed up well in this meeting? Do you feel like it landed? Did you notice people's body language? Kind of asking them to think about how others are reacting in these situations, right? You can get huge tells by looking at the room. You're in a meeting, you're a leader leading a meeting with your team. Are people speaking up? Are they engaged in the conversation? Are they asking questions? Are they sitting back? Are they looking at their phones? You know, like that, that can give them some cues as to are they hit? Is it hitting, right? Is it resonating? How connected is your team? How engaged are they? Are they excited to come to work every day and happy and asking people how they're doing? Or do they go in their offices and shut their doors and don't talk to anyone at all? And get can give you a lot of information. Absolutely. You can pick up a ton from that. But if you're a new manager or a younger manager, maybe an inexperienced manager, you haven't ever had anybody walk you through some of this stuff. It's that breakthrough moment to give them the aha moment that Maybe what they have is not exactly what the world needs. Mm -hmm. And that's my definition of an <laughs> ego, but it's also a definition of a lack of, of self-awareness. Now, if you continue doing what you've always done, expecting different results, that's the definition of insanity. So I think some of the questions from what, from my standpoint, what I ask is, okay, what are you trying to accomplish and how are you getting there? And I think where it comes down, my ha ha moment for me, I always told my team, I said, Hey, if I keep doing what I'm always doing, and you don't tell me anything different. I'm gonna continue acting the way I am. Mm -hmm. And if that's driving you bonkers, making you mad, upset, whatever, I can't change because you haven't told it to me. Mm -hmm. So it took a long time for this to set in. This goes back a few years. Okay. Finally, one day sales manager walks into my office, shuts the door and says, hey, remember you said you wanted feedback, you wanted me to tell you what's going on, you wanted to hear? I said, yeah, hit me. I said, you're always talking about how many cars we sold, how many cars are parked, how many CRs are written, what, you know, what the P&L looks like. You don't ever stop to ask us, how are we doing as an individual? Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can do to help us? You're always like, I'm like, and for me, it was a, it was, it was earth shattering. It ruined, it crushed my ego. Yeah. I needed to hear it. But what it did is it said, it gave me the aha moment that I was taking for granted that I care a lot about people. I didn't yeah. tell them I care. Well, and that it. was my, that was my aha moment. Yeah. And I mean, it goes back to, right? Like you, we think that we're doing certain things in a way and it's going to land forever. Everyone's different and it might not do, they might not land the same way. Telling them, having that conversation. I mean, even what you had said is asking for feedback. I think you can ask one time and people might not tell you anything, right? They have to have that trust and believe that you want to hear the feedback. So showing up and continuing to ask people about how am I doing as a leader, I think is super valuable. And this is flowing perfectly because you said in the introduction that one of the pieces that was building trust. So you said relationships, authenticity, self-awareness. You also said the word trust. So mm -hmm. now 
This is how we build trust. If you're a manager and you're asking your team for feedback. So number one, you need feedback. You've got to hear it. And it might hurt. It might be personal. You got to learn how to separate the information, the data you're given from how you react or the emotions. It's words are just words unless you choose to allow them to bother you. So for feedback reception, you have to choose just to hear the words and not react to them. That's feedback. I got mm -hmm. feedback. So in our, my example, the, Sales manager said, Rich, you, do, you don't care enough about us. You're talking too much about the things that hurt. Okay. Now let's put this in action to build trust. I had to change. So I forced myself to start getting out of my office more, less spreadsheets, less emails, less data driven stuff and go and start having real conversations. Now I'm building trust because they gave me the feedback. I listened to it and then I put it into action. Mm -hmm. And that also is a form of authenticity. I asked for the feedback. I got the feedback. Yeah. I practiced using the feedback. Yeah. And I think that's a, a big aha for managers. No, that's true. I mean, you can't, if you are defensive or don't do anything with that feedback, then it's going to show the team, why would I do this again? Right? Why would I put myself out there, be vulnerable, share that feedback and nothing's going to happen. Right? So that continuous cycle needs to be broken. And it sounds like it was broken immediately by you doing, going out, talking to the teams and being out amongst them. Did you ask any follow up after of how am I doing? Oh, absolutely. I did. Of course. Here's what I, here's what I was expecting. Hey, how am I doing? Oh, you're doing great. That was not the answer I got. You're doing better. And I'm like, what do you mean better? I, to me, I felt like I was doing a ton because I was yeah. out of my comfort zone, but I really wasn't doing enough. So let's fast forward to present day as a, as a manager or a leader. I prefer the title general helper because I'm generally helping people try to become better. Yep. And one thing I try to do every single day when I arrive to work is put my backpack down. Don't even grab a cup of coffee. Maybe I'll grab a bottle of water, grab my safety vest, go outside and say hi to everybody outside. I always see the people inside. That's where my office is. Go out and say hi to everybody. Don't ask them about how many check-in, how many check-ins they did, how many CRs they have. Just good morning. How's it going? Give them a fist bump. But it changes yeah. the dynamics. And I've even had, I've even had other people who are on the outgoing people side of the spectrum, we can get into the disc if you want, but on the outgoing people side, they said, wow, that's really cool. You do that. And I'm like thinking, well, you fit that personality type. I've assessed, I've figured this out. Why are you not doing that? Just had never thought of it. It's hard. It seems some individuals might think like, well, I'm not working, right? I'm not working. I'm not, I'm not hitting the numbers. I'm not doing whatever, but it goes back to that realness. It's going back to real. It's connecting with team members on a real level. You're not asking about work. And then that makes probably the difficult conversations a little bit easier because you already have that connection with them. You've greeted them. You know how their morning is. They feel more comfortable. It feels on a more personal level and they probably enjoy being at work more when the leader is going out and talking to people and they don't just see them behind closed doors and it doesn't seem scary, right? It's easier to have that conversation because you've built that connection. If something does come up, that's really difficult or they even want to provide that feedback. Hey, could you do this a little bit differently? Now they have that personal connection with you. I think that's super important. Leaders be super successful in doing that and getting out and doing some of the things that other leaders might not do. But the other piece it does is it builds the relationship that you talked about very often. So yeah. by going out and not talking about work, I'm not trying to get into their personal lives or what's going on and dig. I'm just trying to build a relationship and say, hi, how are you doing? It's a genuine show that I care who you are and how you feel in this present state. Mm -hmm. And then that starts building up some trust and gets them to start giving me the feedback sooner. The sooner you get the feedback, the sooner you can correct your activities. Because again, what I said earlier is, my definition of ego is waking up every morning, putting both feet on the floor, walking through the world, thinking that what you have is exactly what the world needs. Yep. And it is not. <laughs> no, it's definitely not. So another piece we, you talked about earlier around the personality side. So I'm big into the disc. You and I've had this discussion before. Yep. Very simple way, very quick way to understand how the disc works is there's four, there's four factors, but you listen to what somebody's talking. Are mm -hmm. they talking about things or are they talking about people. If they're talking about people, they're going to be on, on the people side. That's pretty obvious, but there's two sides to that there's outgoing, um, extroverts and there's the quieter ones, the introverts, the outgoing ones are what I call they're, they're inspiring. According to this, that's where the eye comes from yellow sunshine. They're like, Hey, how's it going? How, you know, they're the very outgoing ones are the ones you have to stop the conversation for and say, look, we got work to do because we've done too much relationship building. And then you go to the other, the introverts on the people side are the greens or the steadies. 
And their motto is show me you care. That's all they want to do. And that's how I build a relationship with them is I'm going out, just talking to them and showing them I care. Now let's go to the other side of the spectrum. You and I live on the things spectrum. Mm -hmm. I live in the D, the dominant, because I like to control the conversation like I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. And then you live in the C, the compliant world where you like to have things fit into orderly fashion. For Cs, they're more black and white, yes or no. There's not a lot of middle ground, um, but I think when we talk about self-awareness and you and I've been talking, you've helped me get a little bit out of my red and into some other worlds. And I think I've helped you get a little bit out of your blue. Let's translate this into helping managers and you've got a new manager and helping them understand. I mean, how do you tell them? It's like, look, a new manager, you're being dominant. Let me show you what that is. Hey, you're being too compliant. You're too much about it's perfection or some of the best leaders for me are the greens because they care. You just mm -hmm. got to get them to come out. Or then you got the yellows. It's like, hey, you are great. Everybody loves working with you, but I need you to produce. I need you to help your team get farther along. How do you help them? Yeah. I mean, I, I've had success when we were able to do the personality tests with leaders right? and give them their, their results for their teams. So that's been the greatest amount of success is really opening their eyes and building that connection and showing and giving real examples, putting real examples to the different I like to, I like to think of them as colors, right? That's how I can like recognize them in the four squares is like their colors, like putting the colors to that and saying, Hey, this, this didn't land here. I think one of the great examples is leaders who come in every day and don't ask someone uh, like say good morning, even say good morning, right? For sure. When you're talking about the greens, that's going to send them over the edge and they're going to feel like the leader doesn't care opening up to them and, and giving them some of those real world examples I'm saying like, hey, maybe you could do this. Maybe walk around, right? Maybe go and talk to them. Maybe go into the meeting with this individual. Maybe put agendas. I think that's another example is having a balance depending on what the team is. So coaching your leaders to look at the team, if possible, if you can do the DISC assessment or do some other type of personality assessment just to get a good visual or just coaching them. I don't know. I think again, looking at their team and how they're reacting, right? Is someone already at their desk already working? Well, then that's probably, you know, there might be a data per you might, you might think about that. So you can get a quick assessment each morning as you come in, if you're not able to do a personality test. Another example, you just gave me this aha moment. You're a manager, you're hosting a meeting and you got four people in the room with you. So you're number five. You got one person in there that's like always looking at the watch or the phone, like hurry up, get done. That's your red, your dominant. Their motto is be brief, be bright, be gone. Just give me the information I need and let me go back to what I need to do. And then you've got the person that's always in there, that's always on their phone, always checking their text message, maybe scrolling Facebook or Instagram, who knows what. That's probably going to be your yellow personality. They're like, I'm here for the social factor. And maybe they're super engaged and they're asking a lot of questions that really aren't relevant to the meeting. They're just there because you're there and they like to be around people. And then you've got somebody in there who's like always asking questions like, they always want more information or they want that agenda or they want to understand why they're in the meeting. And those are typically your compliant people. They're the data driven that you're talking about. And then you've got the really quiet one that is hard to read and never says much. And everybody's like, wow, what's going on there? That is probably your green. And they just need you to show them that you care. From a manager standpoint, and this is what I say, ego is walking into the room, you know, or waking up and doing whatever, walking in the room, giving your meeting, expecting what you have to give the team is exactly what they need. But the mm -hmm. problem is, is there's, there's usually in every room, as long as there's four people, there's probably four different types. Yeah. They could all be the same. The more people you have on the team, the more types you have. How do you get that communication? How do you get that communication? I think this is where some of the frustration comes in is like, I had a meeting. I told them what to do. I sent them an email. Why are they not doing it? Yeah. The question is, is are you communicating in a way that they can understand? I think in those examples, you probably want to do a little bit of every, you probably want to try to hit on each of the personality types, have a couple minutes, just a couple minutes, probably of like, Hey, how's it going? Like small talk in the beginning, level set on an agenda, hit on the data points and make sure that there's time at the end for questions for the other ones. But what I will say is I'm a big fan of level setting meetings every once in a while, right? So maybe six months, maybe three months, whatever kind of makes sense of pulling the team. How is the meeting working? Are you getting what you want out of this meeting? If, if you feel like you're not getting the engagement from the team, right? Asking them what they want about the meeting. Maybe you could ask them what they want in the meeting, not necessarily in the meeting. Maybe do a one-on-one -on -one with them. 
if it depends on the team members, some in the color, some of them will give you that feedback right away. Like, Hey, this isn't working for me in there. And others like a green is just going to sit there and they might not say anything. So in a smaller setting or like a one-on-one -on -one setting, ask them, are you getting what you need from that meeting? What would make it more beneficial? What could we change? How can I help you in this meeting? Right. Things like that. But it's good to make sure that you are trying to hit on what each individual will feel successful in that meeting. Let's go back to waking or getting up every morning, going to work and walking around saying hi to everybody. So if you just had a team meeting, so let's say you're the operations manager, you're outside and you've got, maybe you've got check-in CR writers and the lot crew are all reporting to you. Let's say you had an ops meeting the day before and everybody's in there and you've got all these different personalities. You said a game plan for the day, but not everybody heard it the same way. So you, you're up the next day, you're at work, you're walking in, you're going around, you're fist bumping. And if you've, as long as you've done that and you've built a relationship, you can just say, Hey, Kelly, how are you doing? And if mm -hmm. I stand there long enough and just, you know, engage with you, don't even really have to say anything. Now I've given you the opportunity to say, Hey, can you tell me or explain more about yesterday when you're talking about why we have to have all the cars parked 24 hours ahead of time? I mean, I thought 12 hours was good enough. Right. Now you can have those conversations. Yeah. It opens a door. I think another point to what you were just saying is you're creating a little bit of space and silence. Sometimes that little bit of silence, you're just standing there, you're just hanging out with them, right? Can open up that opportunity for them. If you're just quick on your day saying, oh, yep, hi, and then running off to the next person, you miss that opportunity. So that point that you had, it's important to create a little bit of space and, and I'll continue to go back of being real, going back, being real, taking time, being patient with that process and allowing the opportunities to kind of unfold in front of you as, as they should. You might not get everyone to talk all the time, but that little awkward silence also in meetings is sometimes okay. <laughs> in, in awkward silence, it's the power of the pause mm -hmm. is what I say. And I had a mentor that always used to ask everybody one question, but I just, I'm going to talk as it is to me, but yeah. he would ask this question to everybody. He was, he worked that you, if you worked for him, he'd ask you this question and say, Hey Kelly, tell me a story. <laughs> and then he would never say another word and he would just wait. And it was powerful. And I haven't figured out how to master it yet, but people would <laughs> spill their guts to him. He'd be like, yeah. Hey, tell me a story. And instantly, here's what happened to me. My brain would flood with ideas. All right, what does he want to hear? What do I need to tell him? Do I tell him about the do I tell him about the lot damage car we had last you know, yesterday? Does he know about it yet? Oh, does he know about the uh, arbitration that came back? Do I tell him about that? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I was telling him like everything, and I couldn't figure out for the longest time how he always knew everything that was going on at the auction. And then That's as fine. I got older and wiser, I understood. He asked that one question: "Tell yeah. me a story." And that could be anything. It is pretty powerful. That That's amazing. I might use that at some point. Um, anyone could tell anything. They could tell about an issue. We could tell about a problem. You could tell something and it's, they're opening up to whatever they feel like in that moment. I had a opposite. I had an interview a very, very long time ago. And when the person that was interviewing me said, what's the one question that I didn't ask you? And your mind goes to that same thing of being like, oh gosh, <laughs> and then you're like all of the things that you've prepared in your head. So that opening up is, that's huge. That's a good one. Yeah, you can use it. I'll go ahead. Yeah. I'll let you have it. So remember when somebody gives you a tip, it's like, hey, Rich once told me that I should always say, you know, tell me a story. Hey, I had a friend that one time told me I should ask a story. Hey, you know what? You just need to go out and say, tell me a story. And now you own it. So it takes three times and then you own it. It's all yours. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So we've talked about, we talked a little bit about how to build trust. We talked about relationships. We talked about authenticity, front stage, backstage, and we talked about self-awareness. So those are, those are our keys. I'm pretty much on point with you on all those on how to do it. The other thing is if questions, and we talked about a meeting. So we brought up the topic of a meeting. One piece of advice I would give that I learned from a meeting expert. And the one thing I picked up from a conversation that her and I had was, does your meeting have wheels? So in other words, when you're walking into a meeting, are you meeting just to meet or are you mm -hmm. meeting to set a plan to go somewhere and get something done? And it's mm -hmm. difficult. I even struggle, mm -hmm. but I try to always do that and say, Hey, today, what are we trying to accomplish? So when we walk out of here, we have a game plan on where we know we want to go. Yeah. And we feel successful, right? No one likes to have a meeting just because they're having a meeting. So you feel successful having that meeting. 
yeah, feel like it feels like we're making progress, right? If we have something, we have a go forward plan. And that's the other thing where it takes. And now we talk, let's talk about trust where that comes into. So you build your go forward plan and you trust the people to go out. You got to give trust in order to earn trust. So you give trust to go out and execute the plan. Now, here's what often happens. The plan fails. It fails more often than not. Mm -hmm. And now you've got to go back and reassess. And this is where you have the opportunity for learning. What can we learn from this failures and how can we grow? As a young manager back in the day, this is when I was qualified as a jack wagon or a stronger term. I'd be like, what do you mean you can't get that right? It's like, it's really easy. You just clean the car. You just vacuum the car. You just check in the car, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But I would go after the problem. And then the yeah. person felt like I was attacking him instead of taking it back. Like, all right, how do we learn? How do we grow? What do we do from this? So where I'm going with that is, you know, you have these meetings. Let's say we mentioned earlier the example, you got to have all the cars parked 24 hours before the sale. That could be a change. Maybe they were used to only having them parked, like I said, 12 hours, or maybe it's 48 hours. Okay. Just because you told them it has to be done in 48 hours, the change process doesn't happen because you told them or you gave them an email or you wrote the process down. Those are all events. The change is not an event. Change is actually a series of events strung together that yeah. creates that change. One week, two weeks, three weeks, a month down the road. Now you're starting to see that. And the whole change process, believe it or not, actually takes several months. It actually takes mm -hmm. years before it's completed. So, so wow. Doesn't and, but a lot of a lot of people think it just happens overnight, like you were saying, right? To say something one time. I think the power of communication as well. It, when we talked about it a little bit earlier, just because we say it one time doesn't mean it's going to land. I think we see quite often it takes at least three times of sharing the same piece of information in order for it to totally land. Or you might still have an aha moment six months later, like, oh, I finally hear it in this way, in this moment, the way that I think it was supposed to be. Or you might hear pieces of it. So continuing that communication. Communication is another one. Is another big one. And so... <laughs> you and I have talked about communication in the past. What is communication, right? It's it's a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. So if mm -hmm. I send you an email and you don't read it, that's not communication. Yeah. Communication is like the internet. If the internet's down, you can't communicate with the outside world. You got to have you got to have your upload speed and your download speed. And mm -hmm. if you don't have those two working together in sync, you're not going to have communication. Yeah. And if you continue yeah. to email somebody over and over and over again, thinking it's going to change their behavior, once again, we're back to insanity. And there's different methods of communication, right? There's push and pull communication. Do you want to be sent out emails? Like there's uh, intranets, there's picking up the phone, there's walking and seeing someone. There's all different. You can interpret tone and uh, all kinds so, of stuff. So let's talk about authentic, um, authenticity in emailing. Because if you over email, what are all your, what's your team thinking? keyboard right. warrior yeah yeah and we don't want to be a keyboard warrior so how are you authentic so if you stop yourself let's take the authentic authenticity approach stop yourself and ask yourself would you want an email from that person or would you want an email about this topic from your boss or whoever you report to and have that self check and go no i really wouldn't okay then ask yourself what's a better way how would you prefer to have that done mm -hmm. okay maybe maybe you are the data driven person that wants that email but that doesn't, that only hits, if you're using the disk there, that only hits 25% maximum right. of the people. You're leaving out 75%. That's a lot. Yeah. If you only have a 25% chance, right? It's not very yeah, good. Yeah. And you also miss through emails, you miss the personal communication, that opportunity to connect on a real level. And you also miss the, or you have the opportunity to misinterpret through tone. Yes. And it could be, and you could, let's say you're having an email conversation, you're going back and forth and you got a flow going. And all of a sudden the fifth or sixth email comes through, but now it's the end of the day or it's lunch or you got distracted. You got a customer came to the counter and you got to go talk to the customer. Now you're away from your desk. You go back, you go back to work. And then an hour, two hours later, you go back to that email and you respond. And in your head, you're still in the conversation, but the other person's moved on and you send your answer. And now it's totally misinterpreted. It's like, what? Why, why did you get pissed off at me now? Or why did you say that? It's like, oops. Yep. Yep. So, so the email, I am not a fan of email. So if you're yeah. a manager and you're, you're starting to lead, please don't be a keyboard warrior. That's my one piece of advice right. to you. So, so the one skill, so you gave several skills. Let's see if we can wrap this. What would you say if you're going to talk to a new manager and help them? What is the one number one piece they need to work on first to become, have a quality, to become a better leader? Out of the ones that we've mentioned already, I would have to, I'm going to stick with my first one. I'm going to stick with the genuine and the realness. Try to find 
how you are as a person, keep that close balance and continue to, you know, show up as you as best as you can. And that's what people are going to connect with. And I like that, but I'm going to go with a different topic and I'm going to say self-awareness because mm -hmm. I firmly believe that leadership skills, communication skills start with the self. You have to understand yourself, who you are and how you impact other people. So if you don't understand how your actions affect other people, then you lack self-awareness. So once you start having the self-awareness, my opinion, we each have our own, but that's where you can start becoming and becoming more real. It's because it's like, okay, wait a second. What I'm doing is really affecting somebody else. Now, anybody else can argue there's two different ways to enter that, but I'm yep. going to say self-awareness. That's right. You can go to your step first and then mine second. <laughs> yeah. It, and it really doesn't matter either way. You, you will become a better manager and have leadership qualities if you can do both of those, develop self-awareness and develop authenticity. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Meet Me at the Gate. I hope the conversation has helped to fuel your drive and equip you with insights to steer your team towards success. Remember, the road to success is always under construction. And until next time, keep your engines revving and your gas tanks full. So